in uh, your mobile phones, in your computers, and so on. And that's the basic question. How uh, you can move from something which is quite exotic? Here you see the band uh, structure. See, these are the bands in the Rashba system, which are quite complex. I will describe something about that in the second part of my talk. And then you have real objects like these maps. So how can really try to bridge this gap? So there is a lesson that we can learn from the gold age of the quantum era at the very beginning. So just a few dates here to show how things were fast at that time. So 1925, that's the date of block theorem, which is stating that this is the form of a wave function of the electrons inside the solid. This was the beginning of the understanding of the band structure of solids. But immediately after, say 1948, so we are immediately after the Second World War, there was the invention of the bipolar junction transistor, BJT, by these three guys at the Bell Labs. And 1954, the first portable transistor radius appears on the mark. Just four H transistors, but enough to build up a new radio. So you see, just say, 20 years, something in the order of 20 years. And 1959, the invention of the MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor, semiconductor field effect transistor, which is the basic ingredient of all the electronic device that you have in your computer, in your mobile phone. But again, Bell Labs. What a message. Bell Labs were a unique example of a research center in which say, eminent scientists were working together with engineers, together with real people coming from industry, with, with a strong collaboration that led to this very fast development. And if we can learn something is that, okay, we should try to go back to this model, to be faster with respect to, what, to how fast we are. Because if we have to say something, so far we didn't assist to the same fast I'll say development and exploitation by emerging materials like two-dimensional material, graphene, and so on. So another question is, what could be the strategy? And probably one strategy is to go back to the Bell Lab, lab, Bell lab I'll say, example and structure, but also with something which is very well connected to one of the themes of this affair, which is sustainability. Because right now, we have also to pay attention to the fact that supply chain must be sustainable. You cannot really play with the elements as, yeah, as in case they are exactly all equivalent. That's a concept that I would like to explain looking at the periodic table of the element. Everybody knows this periodic table of the element. This is the form that they are used to. All the elements are class in groups, periods, and so on. And we are used as scientists uh, to do something like this. Uh, that's the reason why I have a big periodic table in our lab. So my idea is, OK, you can now choose this element, the other one. You can try to combine them, use different structure, and build up new functionality. That's fantastic. But this form of the periodic table of the element doesn't pay any attention to the supply chain. Uh, when I got the COVID, uh, my idea was, OK, we should look for a different form of periodic table. So I, I, and I was looking in the website, and I found this periodic table of the element, which is provided any, every year by the European Chemical Society. You see how it is stretched, this periodic table of the elements, which is the difference. The difference is that right now you have that the, so the area occupied by each element is proportional to the availability of the elements. And also the color refers to the possible problem that you can have. In green is plentiful supply. When you move to red, see the threat in the next 10, 100 years, which means that not all elements are equivalent. And that's a message. So as a scientist, we should also play with the periodic table of the elements, pay attention that not all the invention, not all the materials could have the same future. And do you know the reason why silicon technology was so fantastic. Look, silicon, very big case, largely available. Supply chain is not a problem. And that's one of the reasons why our technology, current microelectronic technology, is based on silicon. So keep it in mind, I will try to go back to this concept during my presentation. 
So today we're talking about ferroic materials. Just a few definitions. What is ferroic material? In general, it's a material displaying some ferroic order. What does it mean? You can have ferromagnetic material, ferroelectric, ferroelastic. What, what is the peculiarity? In case of ferromagnetics, we have all the spin which are pointing uh, along the same direction, all parallel. That's an ordering situation, an order situation. In case of ferroelectrics, you have the um, dielectric di dipole which are aligned. Again, this is an order state. In case of strain, it's a similar story. So, this is the idea. You have now a material which below a critical temperature, which is the Curie temperature, typically display this order. Another common feature is that they display an hysteresis loop or cycle, like this one. This is the, the loop for the polarization uh, as a function of the electric field that you apply to a ferroelectric. And they display also domains. So typically, they can break into regions which are called domains. You see here some brown and yellow domains for a ferroelectric material. Regions in which the order parameter is the same. Okay, the polarization is pointing upwards, for instance, for the, the brown or downwards for the green. Uh, sorry, for the yellow. And these are ferroid materials. Yeah, they share more or less these uh, peculiarities. And in the title, there is also the the sentence quantum material. So it's difficult to define what quantum material is because in principle every material is a quantum material because quantum, say, uh, so quantum mechanics is uh, our basic uh, language for understanding and explaining the, the behavior of matter. But if we want to give a definition, quantum material could be was material was properties cannot be approximated by macroscopic classical model, which means that you have to apply some more sophisticated quantum mechanics in order to explain their properties. And some example could be, for instance, 2D materials, topological insulator, Rashper system like this one. And we will talk about this story of Rashper system in the second part. Okay, first example, lead free piezoelectric materials. That's an example in which we are deeply involved also in collaboration with company. So what is a piezoelectric material? It's a material with this interesting peculiarity. It can display Direct piezoelectricity, which means that they, they, so you can find the electrical output, so a voltage which is created, upon deformation. So you apply a stress, you deform your material, you see the appearance of a voltage drop. This is used in, uh, typically in sensor, but also in the light. And they display also inverse piez piezoelectricity, which means that it's the other way around. So you apply an electric field and you produce a deformation. This is used for actuators. This is the typical phenomenon which is used also in the printers, in the inkjet printers. Now, which is the current situation? So the best material, the leading piezoelectric material which is used now in technology is PZT, which is the solid solution of uh, lead zirconate and lead titanate. So it's a perovskite. You see the structure that you will see also in the next talk by Eugenio. Uh, typically, the titanium and zirconium atom are placed at the center, but not exactly at the center, you see. They are displaced with respect to this intermediate plane. They can stay even above or below. And the fact of, of being above means that the center of positive charges and that of negative charges are not coincident. And this creates an electric dipole, okay? The center of positive and negative charges are not exactly at the same point, and this typically, in this case, creates a polarization vector which is pointing upward. We translate also in some charges, charges appearing at the surface, which are the polarization charges that you measure when you measure an hysteresis loop. And if you apply an electric field, the interesting story is that you tend to increase the electric dipole. But this means that you are displacing, again, I'll say this atom, so you are stretching your material, which means that you can really apply an electric field which produces now a deformation. This is good for actuation. Okay? You translate an electrical signal into now a mechanical stress and strain. And you see here uh, the typical hysteresis loop for the polarization and for the strain. The relevant parameter here for the application is typically the piezoelectric coefficient, which is described by the, the ratio between okay, the, the strain that you can obtain and, say, the electric field that you apply. And typically for PCT is 200, 300 picometer per volt, which is a good value. It's used for application in many devices. And it can be used for transducer, actuator, sensor, but also in 
uh, microelectronic application for memories, for us, so memories based on the ferroelectric property. What's the problem? What's the matter here? The problem is that it contains lead, and lead is toxic. Lead is toxic, that's the reason why there is a statement by the European Commission that says we should avoid the usage of lead, and so we should find different compounds instead of PCT to be used in real devices. That's the reason why we have a strong collaboration with ST to develop now new materials which are lead-free and can display similar properties. That's the situation uh, that you see here for lead-free piezoelectric. This is a phase diagram. On one axis, you have the different free piezoelectric coefficient. On the other axis, the Curie temperature. So below the Curie temperature, you can use, it, use them. Otherwise, they, uh, they lose their properties. PZT is placed here, so good diffrey free good Curie temperature, but okay, we had this problem of lead toxicity, so we are now investigating this class of material, which is this solid solution of uh, sodium and potassium niobate. You see that performances are quite good, but again, you have some problem. The structure is always the same as the perovskite, but okay, in the bulk, they are excellent. You can reach 800 picometer per volt, which means at least as good as PZT, but in real application, you need a film. And when you have a film, there is a process which is completely different. It must be also compatible with integration, with CMOS technology, many other things, so that in the end, so the performances of the film which are available so far are not a, as good as expected. And that's the reason why we're trying to do something similar to what I told you at the very beginning. We are trying to work in a way which is very close to the real exploitation in a production line. That's the reason why we are doing this development, but not the very small machine with small sample. So the commitment is to use a very big machine with the sample size, which is eight inches wafer. So real wafer, which are compatible with the production line for the production of MEMS devices. And this is something that we are doing in strong collaboration with ST. But, okay, let's go back to the basic question. What about also the sustainability of this? Remember this table of the element. What is critical here? Not sodium, not potassium, of course, not oxygen. They are green here. But there is a problem here with ni niobium. And for niobium, you see in, in yellow, so limited availability, future risk for supply in the future. So you should keep in, in mind, okay, the first speaker arrived, which is a good news <laughs> for you. So I'll say there is this criticality, but there is, also, there is also something else to be taken into account. So if you really perform a, a life cycle assessment for the two materials, PZT and KNN, you discover that K, K, KNN is largely better in terms of toxicity for the user because it doesn't contain lead. But in terms of the energy needed for producing heat, so PCT is better. In terms of the toxicological footprint, considering also the production, so PCT is again better. And in terms also of production of CO2, again, PCT is better. What's the message? The message is it strongly depends on the application. There are some applications for which you could select one material, another application for which you could move to the, to the next one. And in general, there is not a material which is fulfilling all the requirements, but this is life. Second example, ferroelectric rational semiconductor. So this is a quantum material. So three minutes, I will be very fast. Also because now we have the first speaker, so <laughs> we shouldn't be too long. <laughs> Good. Okay, that's another application. Uh, the problem is, is, in this case, computing. You know, the typical problem that we have in our computers is that we are using now this von Neumann architecture in which we have the memory and the computing which are separated in two units. You have a central processing unit, the memory, you are continuously transferring data from memory to computing back and forth, back and forth. This is a, an enormous and huge consumption of energy, which means that this is a prediction in 2030, we should now have that computing could really uh, constitute the 20% of the total consumption of electricity in the world, which is something which is not affordable. So we run now a new strategy under development, trying to develop now new schemes in which you are using a device in which uh, the memory and the computing functionality are coexistent, okay? Exactly in the, same, uh, in the same device. And so you need also different material for doing that. Again, 
let's go to industry. What industry is, is doing in this sense? This is not just an academic need. So this is a paper from Intel guys. Uh, it's a nature paper, 90, sorry, 2019. And this is a proposal for a new device which could replace the CMOS invented in 1954. So the idea is to have now a magnetic element which stored information, which can be written using now a voltage signal using this magnetoelectric coupling, and could be read by using what? Essentially, a, I'll say very peculiar, not very easy to explain phenomenon in which you convert now a flux of spins, you know, each electron is carrying not just the charge, but also the spin. So you can create now a flux of spin angular momentum, which is now converted into a charge signal. According to this paper, the this major device, magnetoelectric spin orbit device, should be more effective, or more efficient than CMOS. So that's the proposal. There's the measure and our proposal is not just our proposal, but we are working with a few groups in the world to this concept, is the phase in which we are using not, say, this magnetic element which switches its state so that it's a memory. So the magnetic element is fixed, or you use another strategy to produce a flux of spins. And here we are using a completely new material, which is a Rashba material in which we play with the conversion between a, a flux of spin angular momentum into a charge. And here the state, the variable of state, is the ferroelectric polarization. So with some electric field, you can change the state of polarization pointing upward or downwards. You can run now different stable state, either just one zero up and down or intermediate states with different logic states. And you can read them by using this conversion. And the material we are playing with is germanium telluride, which is now a material in which you see this, uh, uh, these planes of tellurium and germanium atoms. And uh, the idea is that, again, is a displacive ferroelectric, like in case of titanates and uh, niobates that you have seen. So that, okay, you see, by applying a field, you move uh, this plane of the germanium atom with respect to tellurium. And in the end, you can change the direction of the polarization vector. And that's something interesting. They are ferroelectric, but they are also displaying the rush effect, which is now a real, really a quantum mechanical phenomenon. So when you break inversion symmetry, and typically you have a, an electric field or an equivalent so electric field, you have that the bands are no more the parabolic bands that you find in the normal metals and so on, but you find this split in the K. And interesting story is that there is always the so-called spin momentum locking, which means that if the electron is moving in, that, in this direction, the spin will be all, always orthogonal, 90 degrees. And the interesting story that we discovered at the very beginning is that in this material, you change the polarization and you change the sense of rotation of the spin. So I will not explain how it works in practice, but the basic message is this one. With this new exotic material, you apply an electric field, you switch the ferroelectric polarization, and you act on the spin of the electrons. So you have an electric way to control now the spin texture of the material, and then you can play with this in order to implement something like the MISA device. And that's the fissure. So we made different, I'll say, papers in which we demonstrate also here in Trieste at Synchrotron Radiation Facility, we demonstrate that it works. And right now we are building out some devices in order to show that they could exp ex uh, really exploit this phenomenon. Finally, sustainability. Again, the same periodic table. Okay, germanium and tellurium, they, they are not green, which means probably that's a good concept, but germanium and tellurium could not be the final material in terms of sustainability of the supply chain. And that's all for this talk. I just try to uh, give you some, uh, I'll say, provide you with some ideas how we could try to bridge the gap from new material to real application. The message is that sustainable products must be based on, on a sustainable supply chain. I try to convince you that ferroid materials are a fascinating class of materials, and also Eugenia will tell you that, okay, they could, could really, ex really be exciting material for many applications. 
And of course, there is a lot of work to be done in order to really move to application also in this case, but this is on the way. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Riccardo. Very nice talk. Uh, and uh, although we have to go quickly to the next speaker, I want to take the opportunity to grab one very quick question from the audience. But uh, we have also to save some time for a discussion later on. But if there is some question from you, some curiosity for the speaker, otherwise I will take <laughs> the, the opportunity to make my question just to underline one point. No question from you? OK. Um, OK, you presented a, a very pragmatic example, ferroic materials, but actually you touched a very important point, how you can span across many different functionalities just playing with the, uh, the structure, playing with the structure and engineering different heterostructures. So how this can promote uh, uh, tuned uh, applications for the future and uh, where you can see the front, one of the possible frontiers of these materials, for instance. Okay, we have seen, for instance, the case of uh, that free piezo that uh, we have some classical material that can be exploited, like niobates, uh, also titanates, instead of PZT. But there are also other proposals, uh, different structure, moving also to, to D material, even though 2D material is not so good for very strong forces to be applied in real devices. But there is something that I would like to, to tell you concerning a new strategy, which is that of using now machine learning techniques in order to make new discovery of new materials. This is something which is now becoming more and more popular. We also have a project in collaboration with Silvia Picozzi to do something in this direction. Try to use now DFT machine learning combined in such a way to to find new materials which are probably now not completely disclosed in order to make a combination of things since the very beginning. And one of the ingredients is also the sustainability. So when you start at the very beginning, you say, okay, I want to find a material with this peculiarity, but also with a, an affordable supply chain. So you start from an educated guess and you design the material yeah. and then you try yeah. to... And that's to me be. something that could really give rise to a sort of revolution also for the, an acceleration towards the real impact of this material on application. Okay, so I will move to the next speaker. So please, Eugenio. Okay. Thank uh, you again, Riccardo. Yeah, thank you, Regina, and thank you the organi to the organizers and uh, Caterina for uh, allowing me to, uh, to speak today to you all. Um, I'm Eugenio de Rey. Um, I uh, teach optics and photonics at the physics department of the University of Rome, La Sapienza, um, where I have an experimental group. And, um, and today I'll be talking to you about this uh, very, very uh, specific uh, perovskite that, from my point of view, is relatively amazing to the point that um, we personally don't believe uh, what we're uh, seeing, but yeah, it, we, we sort of experimentally see these things. How do you go on? How do you? The right one. The right one? Over there? Okay. So, perovskites. Um, this is a word, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the word perovskites. Have you heard that? Like, for example, for solar panels, they're saying, uh, you know, it's going crazy. The situation is going crazy. First, we have silicon-based solar panels and uh, semiconductor, um, multi-quantum well, and so forth. And now we have perovskites, right? And um, yeah, so that's why they become famous. But they've been around for a very long time. And a lot of the crystals that uh, Ricardo was talking about were perovskites, and they're well known uh, for uh, over a hundred years. Um, and I'll tell you more or less why they're important today and why they were important yesterday, and they'll probably be important in the future. Um, I guess one thing you can do, do, do we have a laser here? Yep. I guess one, uh, one thing is you see this formula. It's all like numbers. I don't know if you see it. There's a little thing blocking it here, but it says 0110630037. What is that? And it's a beautiful crystal, by the way. Here, you see the real crystals right up here, and you can cut it, and it's a very beautiful, perfect crystal. How can you have a perfect crystal? 
with all this junk inside, right? That's perovskites. They allow you to do uh, pure, pristine crystals with junk inside. That's why they're important. That's why they're hoping that they work for solar panels, okay? Um, so first of all, why does that happen? Well, this, I think you've seen something like this uh, in the previous talk. It's a very complicated structure. It's not like salt, where you have plus, minus, and they're all, they're um, all, oops, sorry. Um, so you've got uh, pluses here, plus, 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 plus. Then you've got another plus at the center, generally smaller ion. And then you've got normally some anions here, typically in oxides, um, that's oxygen. So they're all really compacted together. All these ions compacted together. And what happens is that there's a mixture between um, you know, ionic bonds and covalent bonds, the ones you study in high school, right? They're mixed together. And ultimately, the chemistry is governed by, for me, mysterious uh, d orbitals that are very complex. Um, and the result is, this structure will replicate even if you start changing the components. So now you can, you can imagine the, the, you know, the good witch, right? The Bifana, right? The Bifana, she's, she's stirring her pot, right? And it's a liquid. We all think about liquids, right? Well, now you're stirring the pot right? I actually had a picture of this. It, 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 it went somewhere. I don't know. It doesn't pop up. Anyways, stirring the pot, you know what I'm saying? Stirring the pot, and, and, and it's a solid. And it's so pristine that it allows you to light to go through, for example, um, or to have high photoconduction, high ferromagnetism. But now you can do it. You know, you could use some, some algorithm to do it, but yeah. So the the idea is, is that you, they can be grown in many different ways. They retain a perfect crystal lattice in the presence of substitutions. And you can basically incorporate in a single crystal a lot of those metals, right? Not all of them, but a lot of those substances. Um, so here you see the, are they naturally occurring? Sure. Perovskites uh, like are in the mantle. I don't know how they know that they're in the mantle. You have to ask some geologists because I don't think we can actually see what's in the mantle. But probably you can infer from what comes out. There's a CaTiO3, um, which is a very, very common. It's the actual first perovskite. It's totally useless today. Maybe in the future someone will find a way to use it. But this is very, very common. We're going to be talking about artificial um, um, perovskites. They're, they have the same structure, but they're artificial. And specifically, we're going to be talking about what's called KLTN, which, of course, you've understood, is a mixture of all those elements in some form that gives a perovskite that has some interesting properties. And how do you grow them? You can grow them any way you want. There are people that grow them with sol gel, I mean, just, I don't know, in a chemistry lab. The way we have to grow it, and I here have a very, uh, you know, internet downloaded uh, image, 1954. This is the Tchaikovsky or pulling method. You literally put a piece of your crystal here, and then you start pulling. You see, you start pulling the crystal, and it grows like a tree. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, so once, well, I, I can't tell you anecdotes. Anyways, but the, from perovskites, in terms of solar cell, cell energy conversion, you can see that the perovskites are pushing it up here, you see? Um, there's just a little asterisk. Does anyone see that asterisk there? There's an asterisk, right? Yep. Um, that's a disclaimer, right? This is a paper in Nature. Um, it says, we don't know what is their uh, consistency in time. Will they degrade in time? Because their perovskites are used in catalysts, for example. They allow capturing of uh, CO2 and stuff like that. So what happens if you expose them to an environment? But ultimately, this line will go up, and in about four or five years, we'll have perovskites that are better than uh, other technologies. But so the one we're going to be talking about here is KLTN in terms of photonics. 
So it's marginally connected to solar panel technology, of course. Solar panel technology is more for uh, photoconduction than just transmission. But you know that photonics is quite important. Um, if you ask um, for the future, what are you going to do? You're going to make quantum computers. They're going to be a mixture between uh, whatever he said and whatever I'm saying. They're going to be something complicated or they're not going to be anything at all. We don't really know. But we need the optics. And this is optics and this is the crystal. So the crystal is this uh, potassium lithium tantalate niobate. There's also this other one. Let me remember if I potassium sodium tantalate niobate. Okay, and as you see, they're mixed. Okay, so you have X, which can be anywhere between, actually X is very, very small. Okay, so X, let's assume it's just, just zero. Uh, but Y, this is one part or two parts in a thousand, but Y can be 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. What it means, these are substitutions. And this notwithstanding, you get very beautiful crystals. Uh, trust me, these are beautiful crystals. I don't know if, if you can, you know, believe me, but they are. Um, so they really, like these crystals, have a whole lot of like weird properties we don't really understand. First of all, they have disorder. How can they be disordered and be all ordered? I'll tell you about that a little bit. They're disordered in some way and ordered in many other ways. Then they have very, very strong nonlinearity, uh, like you shine light inside and things happen, uh, that, that we call that giant response. If you apply electric fields, they have enormous uh, nonlinearities. They even have turbulence, like you can even like send light in and it goes like, you know, when water is boiling, right? Sort of like turbulence. And um, just to give you an idea, and I'm not like, I'm not like bragging now because Giorgio Parisi didn't even say thank you, right? So he doesn't even, I mean, he knows me, right? Because we, uh, his son works in the room in front of me. His son, I mean, no, not his son, the son of his brother. Okay. Anyways, whatever. Um, so basically, if you read the motivation uh, of uh, the Nobel Prize, for 2021 for Giorgio Parisi, right? There's two experimental papers in replica symmetry breaking, two like main papers. One is on random lasers by a colleague of mine called Claudio Conti. And the other one is on turbulent optics in KLTN that, that you know, I, I'm an author of it, but it was my PhD student, uh, Davide Pierangeli, who did it. So this is, uh, uh, the nonlinearity was so strong that we were able to observe for the first time uh, replica symmetry breaking in a wave system, okay? Apparently, the people in, uh, in, in that gave him the Nobel Prize thought they were, uh, you know, saying, oh, these are students of Giorgio, but, you know, we're not. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I only know Giorgio from a professional point of view. I wasn't, I never had him as a professor, so, um, although I did study at Sapienza at a certain point for some time. Um, so what's going on? Well, the fact is that this material is extremely susceptible. It, has, it can move, if you bring it close to the Curie point, the central uh, structure of the ions can distort. And this distortion can be huge because the material still maintains its overall coherence. Okay? And um, so what happens? Let's assume now that I tell you, each one of you uh, choose a color between black and white. Okay? Okay, you're going to choose black, white, black, white, and each one of them. And then you're going to say, well, go, to the, go and convince the guy next door, right? And then you're going to convince him to change color. And ultimately, you're going to create these big blocks where people are going to be convincing other people until at the end, you're fractured. There's like 50 people here that are all color black, 50 people there that are all color black, uh, white, and no one wins because there's a wall in between, right? That's called a domain wall. By the way, this is not... Whatever I told you is, is completely not understandable. Have, has anyone ever been to a, 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 where you get married, a, 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 um, a wedding party, right? And there's a round table. And then you don't know if this is your bread or like for me, it's, I'm, I'm worried about the bread. Some people are worried about something else, but is this my bread, right? And then you don't know because, so I'm like taking this one. And on the other side, I'm hoping the other guy that also wants to eat because he's like hungry, uh, that he picks the right side. But if he picks the other side, then everyone, blah, 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 and then suddenly we have two topological defects on the two sides. Okay, that's a domain wall. So this is the object, right? There's a broken symmetry in the case is which, is this my bread or your bread, right? Broken symmetry, and this is the domain wall, and it doesn't move anymore. Most of the physics connected to what is optics is connected to these things. There are these, you know, like, you understand what I'm saying? Like, half the table has chosen the left side, the other half has chosen the right side, and then there's a guy here who has no bread, and the other guy on the other side has two breads, 
And you can't do anything about it because he's not, you understand? He, like people have already started eating and there's COVID and everything, so it's, it's gone. Okay, so the idea is that these domains, these domains are now complicated because the broken symmetry is in, six, is in three dimensions, not six, I mean three, six orientations but three dimensions because you can go and, you know, it's, you imagine having the bread and then uh, something else and so forth. And anyways, you create this whole mess of uh, topological defects and these obey something like a dipolar glass, uh, like a liquid crystal, but it's in a crystal, okay? And this is the essentially compositional disorder that leads to all of the effects um, that are extraordinary in these materials, okay? Um, amongst these, there's an interesting effect here that you see in X-ray. The material, if you heat it, it becomes smaller. Do you, do you know that there are materials that if you heat them, they become smaller? And don't think about like burning paper. You know, you burn paper because no, that's not it. You got to heat something and it becomes smaller. Do you know anything that if you heat it becomes smaller? Sorry? Yeah, a rubber band. Did you say that? A wristband? A rubber band. Like, you know rubber bands? I mean, once upon a time, I remember my dad, he stopped smoking and he started... Is that, has anyone had that experience? He started eating rubber bands. No, no it's terrible. Anyways, I'll tell him not to do it. He's still alive. Uh, so, I hope. Uh, anyways, and they become shorter when, you, when they heat up, right? And the reason is because of disorder, okay? I'm not going to get into this, but if you, if you ask me, I'll tell you what some people think about this, okay? And that's what happens here. So, it's a disordered system. You heat it up, and it shrinks, Okay? Which, so that gives you some idea of some interesting property. I don't know how you actually use that, but there are engineers that know how to use these things. Um, another thing is giant response. So you see here, normally, you saw in, in the case of Ricardo, he was showing the hysteresis curves, right? If you're above TC or close to CC, there's no hysteresis. It's just, you know, I push something and it's pulled. I apply an electric field, the charges go farther away. It's like an elastic band. I pull it, it becomes longer, right? And ultimately, this disorder, the system gives you this peak here. So instead of going straight, like Hooke's Law, you know, the, the one we learned in high school, Hooke's Law, it becomes like this. And here, there's a giant response. Very small electric field, very high polarization. That's ultimately what's happening in these materials. And there's a very strong relationship to quantum systems at a very low temperature. They have these properties here. But these are at room temperature. So, okay, so this is, we're beginning to get a little bit amazed by what's going on. The most amazing thing I think was this. Um, so if I'm able to, uh, so basically, um, so you have these crystals and you cool them down to their Curie point. It's like having water and boiling it or having water and freezing it, right? And then we're all doing experiments at temperatures higher than TC. Right? And then if you ask me, why are you doing it at temperatures higher than TC, why don't you go at TC at when the crystal becomes ferroelectric, or it's like ice, you know, becomes solid, right? Why do you do experiments? Because we see strange things. Well, one of my PhD students is always this Davide. Um, you know, he was out of control. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to look at optics at the Curie point. I'm sorry. Yeah. So he's now working for CNR. Uh, so he's cool. Um, anyways, um, and he said, I'm going to look at it. And I said, you're going to see weird things. And he said, I already seen the weird things that you're saying, but I've seen more. Uh, so what happens is when you freeze something down, right, it becomes disordered, right? Because everything stops where it was. Like imagine me freezing you all down. You're all going to, you know, right? Everyone's disordered. Well, that's what normally happens in a phase transition. It's called critical opalescence because there's disorder, the, the phase transitions, uh, you know, the, the correlation length increases and you have large scale, small scale disorder. It all becomes boiling, okay? No, in these perovskites, the system becomes ordered completely when you put it at the phase transition to the point that you can see with light what you normally see with x-rays. And these are called so-called ferroelectric supercrystals. Okay, now these are interesting. Okay, who cares? This is, you can actually see them. This is not uh, electron microscopy. This is like you see it with a microscope. Like the crystals have these properties, okay? They're very weird. I won't explain to you. I mean, I won't talk to you, but if you change the temperature, you apply electric field, these have all these motions and weird, uh, interesting phenomena. Ultimately, they can be associated to this type of structure 
um, which is rather complex, and I've been told that we should not discuss this too much, okay? Because it's, um, you see, this is a vortex, right? You can imagine a vortex. So you can imagine, you remember when we said topological defect, you're eating bread, and there are two people, one with two breads and one with none, right? You can imagine if you increase the dimensionality, ultimately you'll have a vortex. So an object that is, you know, one is pushing here, the other one's pushing here, the other one's pushing here, the other one's pushing here, and we're all sitting there. Because everyone is pushing and pulling, and you're all just sitting there, okay? That's that thing, and that's what's generating these objects. This is in three dimensions. Now, it's a little bit more complex to understand what happens when you have three dimensions, yep. So anyways, the interesting thing is, if you have light shine into one of these, uh, let's say, vortex cores, it suffers so-called giant refraction. So what's giant refraction? Um, so you've all seen this. Does anyone know what this is from? Yeah, Pink Floyd, right? So there's light going in, right? And then it's, you know, separated into its colors. But why in Pink Floyd is this gray? According to you, what, what should this be? Already colored, right? Correct? Yeah, correct? Because it's already dispersing. So this is already colored. Now what happens if you have an index of refraction of 30? Um, so let me get to that. Okay, so what happens if you have an index of refraction of 30? You remember Snell's law? So now the angle, index of refraction, the angle, all the light is caused to go in the same direction and caused to come out. No longer there's dispersion. Okay, and that's exactly what happens in these materials if you shine light inside the vortex cores and the saddle points in these top, uh, higher, higher dimensional topological defects, you see this. So you see here there's white light focused from a commercial projector at the input of this crystal and it comes out at the output. And ultimately, um, people did not believe us. Yep, it's over? Okay, so let me just show you. Uh, so anyways, no one was believing that perovskites could do this. Um, so we had to make a movie, okay? So this is uh, Ludovica Falsi. She was at the time my uh, PhD student. And I'm not sure how you can actually make the movie start. Is, there, is it possible to, to make the movie start? No? Okay, well, but anyways, believe me. Okay, you can, look, there's the cover of, uh, oh, here we go. So she hits it. Okay, and it, like, okay, so does it, yeah, it actually pulls along light with it. it it's, and, and like, you know, it's, I mean, this is actually, we're not even, like, the, anyways, they finally believed us, and, and we published it, um, and, and we didn't actually get the cover, of, we're not on the cover, this, this is us right here, okay, giant refractions, not this, but it happened to be the same structure, pros, everyone's using proskite, so we're okay with that. <laughs> Okay. Anyways, so thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Eugenio, for the very interactive talk. So this is the reason for which, since we have no time for questions, I will move immediately to the next speaker that I'm pleased to introduce because we had no time before, Francesca Toma. Actually, Francesca has a past that she will tell you about in Trieste, but she has been for many years in Berkeley, and now she's director of the Insti Helmholtz Institute and just since some months. So please, Francesca. Thank you, Regina, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, there, oh, okay. Okay, so I don't know if I can compete here with the previous speaker, but I'll try. I'll tell you today why we should care about polar bears. Anybody knows, actually? What's the emblem? Why, what are these, uh, the emblem for polar bears? Okay, I'll tell you by the end of the talk. So today, but even yesterday, so this generation that you represent, we are tasked to push a consistent green energy revolution in the next decade. And why? Because we need to get rid of fossil fuel as soon as possible. So Europe, for example, has, uh, uh, has, has low that by 2030, uh, we cannot have cars that are run on fossil fuels. So we need to find other fuels that we can use. And then the big question is how and what? 
So today I'm going to talk to you about the energy carriers of the future, specifically about one in particular, and how we can go beyond fossil fuels. I want to tell you first about my story, because I think it can be uh, relevant to some of you. I was born and raised here in Italy. I studied uh, um, in Italy. Uh, I was born in Veneto, in a place called Noale, grew up there, and then I went to a university in Padova, studied uh, um, pharmaceutical chemistry, moved here to Trieste, and uh, I got my PhD at the Advanced, Stud Advanced School, for International Schools for Advanced Studies, uh, PhD in biophysics, and, uh, uh, and then uh, I actually am very grateful to Aria Science Park because it co-founded my fellowship to go to University of California, Santa Barbara. So I moved to University of California, Santa Barbara, which is a beautiful campus in front of the ocean. And then uh, I stay there for 18 months. And then I moved to Berkeley, uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley. And after that, uh, I was a staff scientist for about 10 years uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So this is to tell you where I've been, and now I'll tell you what I've done. So here in Trieste, I first studied materials, uh, and that is what has really uh, defined my career as a scientist. Uh, being able to make materials, being able to characterize materials. I worked here on drug delivery and utilizing uh, uh, carbon, nano, uh, carbon nanotubes specifically for drug delivery and tissue engineering. Because I knew how to make materials, I could use the same substrate to make catalysts. And so that's how I actually moved uh, into catalysis. I was using the same construct that I was using for drug delivery, as weird as it can sound, and I was using the construct to, the construct to immobilize catalysts for water splitting. Water splitting is that when you split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Then I got passionate about energy materials, uh, and that's why when I moved to University of California, Santa Barbara, when I was uh, uh, at University of California, Berkeley, I studied uh, organic and inorganic materials for solar cells. We have heard a little bit about that, and I actually made some of the perovskites, not the one that uh, uh, Professor Dere showed today, but others uh, that are the ones that are actually used now for making solar cells. So. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the type of sources of energy that we can use and that are relevant to a list of research that I do. So we have solar cells here. We can get uh, energy from windmills. I don't work on windmills. We can uh, get uh, energy from batteries. Uh, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with battery cars. And uh, uh, we can also get energy if we split, for example, water into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is an energy carrier. We can get uh, fuels from carbon dioxide. Don't know how many of you are uh, aware of this. I've spent the last uh, five plus years working on how we can make fuels out of CO2, carbon dioxide, utilizing sunlight. So if we focus our attention on solar cells, battery cars, and uh, um, doing water splitting and reducing carbon dioxide electrochemically, then uh, we can make some more consideration. So I need to um, make a disclaimer here. I've lived uh, in the United States for the past 15 years. I actually just recently moved back uh, to Germany, like recently six weeks ago. So um, I may not be fully up to date uh, with cost of energy here in Europe. I, I'm sure I'll soon find out. However, in the US, the price of solar modules uh, is uh, uh, less than $0.5 per watt. And this is really cheap. And in fact, I can tell you, at least in California, we make more solar energy. Uh, we make more uh, energy out of uh, uh, sunlight than we actually need which is great, I think. Um, we are at, um, in line, we're getting uh, uh, at the goal of price of uh, 0 0.05 dollars per watt by 2030, and uh, uh, solar panels uh, uh, are useful to make other type of energy. So when uh, you have a solar panel, you can use it immediately as electricity, but if you don't store that electricity somewhere, then it's a problem because you cannot use it when the sun is not shining. So that's why we have batteries, for example, or that's how we could make chemicals out of sunlight. So um, 
high energy in this system is crucial for uh, battery cars, for example, but also stability. And uh, when we are thinking uh, about uh, whether we should go for batteries or cars, um, we should consider that solar and chemical fuels are a convenient way to store electricity as their volumetric and gyrometric energy density outperform batteries. You don't believe me? I'll show you. So here are lithium-ion batteries, and you have here the volumetric density, and here the specific energy density that can also be uh, called ways, um, like what weighs less, so gravimetric density. So here, down here, are lithium-ion batteries, and as you see, I mean, not surprisingly, uh, all other fuels are up here. So if we can make this uh, uh, out of something else rather than fossil fuel, we will be we're doing really good. And hydrogen is here. So it has uh, um, high um, gravimetric density. So I'm focusing on hydrogen now. How and where hydrogen can be used? Hydrogen can be used uh, in many, many sectors. So here you see the uh, greenhouse gas emission by sector. One uh, uh, sector that is not hard to uh, decarbonize uh, is electricity, but as you see, electricity is actually a very small pie um, in, the, in the game. And uh, uh, what instead uh, is really uh, difficult to decarbonize is transportation, buildings, and industry. And we can use hydrogen for all of that. So we've just uh, seen uh, the prism and uh, uh, that uh, can uh, split light. Hydrogen is the simplest colorless element, uh, sub uh, but I'm sure you have heard that there are many colors of hydrogen. And these many colors of hydrogen are, of course, uh, something that is, uh, uh, that is being uh, defined, but I also have my little prism here. And uh, um, hydrogen is the lightest element, is the most abundant. However, it doesn't exist itself by, um, in nature. And then we have to make it. And we have several different ways to make it. And uh, the colors of hydrogen are the way we make hydrogen. So I think this is kind of important uh, whenever you hear talking about hydrogen, understanding what is black hydrogen or brown hydrogen, what is blue hydrogen, what is green hydrogen, which I'm really passionate about. So black and gray hydrogen, uh, well, first of all, these colors uh, are dependent on how much uh, greenhouse gas emission is related to uh, hydrogen production. And uh, uh, when you have black and uh, gray hydrogen, you're actually also producing carbon. So it's a good form to make uh, uh, hydrogen, but it's uh, the, not the best. Blue hydrogen is a better way to make hydrogen, a better pathway uh, together with turquoise uh, hydrogen, because uh, uh, you are basically paralyzing your burning material in uh, uh, an environment where there is not oxygen. And so you are solidifying uh, the uh, carbon emission into carbon, into solid carbon. So you're not re-emitting uh, uh, hydrogen into the atmosphere. Whereas uh, here, with uh, black or gray hydrogen, hydrogen uh, you are, uh, for example, burning methane, and when you burn methane, you have hydrogen and uh, you have uh, CO that are coming out, uh, and, uh, and you don't really want that, uh, even though in chemistry and chemical industries utilize for other reactions. What we are really aiming for here is green hydrogen, hydrogen that you produce without emission, with zero emission. And so, for example, water splitting, you just directly make hydrogen and oxygen. However, to power a reaction like water splitting, you need energy. So where is that energy coming from? Depending where the energy is coming from, then we can have emission related to it. And so that's why you hear uh, about uh, yellow hydrogen. And for example, this is electrolysis that is still run using fossil fuel, which is kind of cheating if you want. Uh, finally, we have pink hydrogen is becoming quite a um, huge topic in the US, which is hydrogen that is produced utilizing nuclear energy as the source uh, uh, to make, um, to give, um, to do electrolysis. So now I also have a video to show where we make hydrogen utilizing sunlight. Can we? I can do it. That? No. no. If they click on the. 
Yeah. Okay. It's Okay, perfect. Okay, now the sun goes off and uh, uh, you'll see bubbles and this bubbles is hydrogen. What is this? This is a 3,5 semiconductor. So Eugenio earlier talked uh, or uh, Ricardo talked about silicon. This is gallium arsenide. Very high uh, performance photovoltaic. You have a catalyst on top, you shine light. Uh, you, in this case, we are not using anything else rather than sunlight. You can make hydrogen 10 times better than what nature does. Because, uh, of course, uh, uh, nature does this, uh, not making hydrogen, but uh, making fuels uh, in forms of hydrocarbons with natural photosynthesis. So, here, um, we have several materials that are going into our system. So we have uh, the solar cell that I'm calling as light absorber one and light absorber two. Then we have a catalyst, uh, um, catalyst to oxidize and a catalyst to reduce water. And then uh, uh, we have the electrolyte, which is uh, um, some water-based uh, electrolyte. All of these uh, um, different materials are brought together by contacts and interfaces that you need to carefully um, look at uh, and, uh, and fabricate so that the device is stable and the charges are going where you want. So I want, uh, before closing and before telling you why polar bears are important, uh, tell you what I've done specifically in the field uh, and uh, what I think uh, is my fantastic material here. So we didn't discover this material, but we discovered the functionality of this material. We looked at gallium nitride that deposited on silicon um, solar cells, basically, for hydrogen production. And what we found is that this material uh, transforms uh, into gallium oxynitride, and gallium oxynitride becomes a, a very stable material uh, and active uh, to make hydrogen at uh, 3.5 suns. So now just imagine to have an intensity of light that is 3.5 uh, the intensity of of uh, what we are using, AM 1.5, which is basically simulating the sunlight, and uh, uh, stable for these many hours that you say 150 hours are nothing, and I'm saying yes and no, because uh, usually these, device, uh, uh, these devices fail in like a minute sometimes even faster. So this is actually a huge achievement. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this material that uh, we have heard perovskites, and this is a wood side structure. So uh, I, I just told you, we look at this kind of materials uh, and they are not stable. Uh, by the way, this is uh, a chronon in which we are looking at current as a function of time. Uh, here we are looking at current as a function of voltage. This is the material when we first tested, and this is uh, how it goes over time. So you see two things. You see the current is increasing. You see you have an anodic uh, shift of the onset potential. Uh, without going into many details, uh, this is really, really good, and uh, in most cases unheard of. So we looked more in details what was happening. We looked uh, at the oxygen peak, uh, because oxygen is everywhere, it absorbs uh, everywhere. And uh, uh, we found a component uh, of oxygen absorbed to gallium uh, and hydroxyl on uh, uh, the surface of the material. Then we start running our current parametry test. So we look at the current as a function of time. We do uh, our chemical analysis again here. So again, uh, oxygen 1S by X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And we found a new component, uh, oxygen bound to nitrogen bound to gallium. Then uh, this component increases over time uh, and uh, it stabilizes eventually. In my group, uh, we uh, run an analysis uh, that is conductive atomic force microscopy and uh, we look at the distribution of photocurrent. I'll just cut the story short. We saw a threefold increase of the photocurrent at the nanoscale. You're looking here at uh, two microns area and the thickness of a film is less than 100 nanometers. And we saw that this threefold in, um, increase in the um, photocurrent was localized uh, where the valleys of the materials are. So we look at the valleys. So basically, if you look at uh, your crystals uh, and the thin film, these are the valleys. And we looked at what was uh, uh, there from a chemical point of view. So this is a stem image, st scanning transmission, uh, electron microscopy. You are looking at the nitrogen K edge, gallium K edge, oxygen edge. You see colocalization of gallium, of oxygen, 
on the top and nitrogen and gallium on the side, on the pristine material. Then we run our test and now we see that we have nitrogen, gallium and oxygen on the sidewall. We remember the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy spectrum and this uh, oxygen, gallium, nitrogen, gallium components uh, that uh, is in line with this uh, and uh, uh, the threefold increase in the photocurrent at the valleys of the film which is also in line with what we are observing here. So I'm telling basically you that uh, over time you're able to produce this uh, uh, gallium oxynitride phase. So then I came back to Germany about uh, six weeks ago where I'm starting uh, what I call my next phase uh, in my career and uh, uh, after focusing so much on uh, energy materials uh, to halt climate change, what I want to do next uh, in terms uh, of sustainability is to really think how we can make materials in renewable energy sustainable. And this is why, because uh, we have uh, already a lot of waste, 2.01 gigatons we are producing right now of solid waste per year. This uh, number is going to uh, increase uh, by 70% uh, uh, by 2050. And a lot of this um, uh, waste is also going to be represented by renewable energy devices. So we need to think uh, how we make uh, uh, everything more sustainable in these terms. So why polar bears? Polar bears are the emblem of climate change. They are at the apex of uh, uh, the ecosystem. And uh, if we continue to waste materials, uh, to have uh, oil spills, uh, and uh, to just not do for climate changing, who we are hurting at the very end is us. So we need to care about polar bears because at the end of the game, we need to care about a world worth living in. I want to thank uh, uh, all the members of my group and collaborators. You don't do science uh, if you're not collaborating, in my opinion. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Regina and Francesca, for the invite. Thank you very much, Francesca. Actually, I see people waving from the back of the room, but I just want to close this session with a very quick question, one for each. Uh, so, oh. I think we went across many different uh, crucial points, sustainability, uh, attention to uh, waste, uh, circular economy somehow. So, Ricardo, for you, which could be one very quick uh, take-home message for the audience, for people that m may want to start to work on material science? Well, probably the message is that can looking at the periodic table as it was in my talk, we should really pay attention to the different uh, peculiarity of each element in terms of sustainability. That's a revolution in the approach that scientists must have to materials, especially if you want to build up, build up something which is really sustainable. That's my basic message. I would like to change the periodic table that we have in our lab with that I've shown you just to convince also students that what you are doing could be exotic, very interesting, scientifically sound, fantastic, but in the end of the day, if you want to do something for the beers, polar beers, we we'll also have to, to think about the sustainability of the materials. Thank you. And Eugenio, you have gone through many examples about how, how would you translate those into, for instance, a possible application that people may want to use for industrial involvement or this kind of uh, concrete return of the research that you are also performing. Yeah, so, um, for example, one thing that could be thought of is to miniaturize uh, optical, optical devices. So, if you have a high, in, in optics, everything is determined by lambda, the wavelength, divided by the index of refraction everything. If you uh, decre increase the index of refraction and somehow, I didn't explain how, you're able to get light into the system and out of the system, uh, you, but you saw that you can do that, but then you can reduce the size of everything. And if you reduce the size, you reduce the cost. If you reduce the cost, you, re you somehow address uh, sustainability. It's not magic, so it, that's not how it works. Um, I think Ricardo knows more about how it does work than I do. But if you decrease the size, ultimately, you're doing a good thing. 
and I will uh, close with Francesca. This is a very biased question from my side, but I will say from Aria Science Park side. You said something very important. We didn't discover a new material, but we discovered a new functionality. How electron microscopy can be essential to discover new functionalities? Yeah, it's a biased question, and I'm, I'm not a microscopy myself, but I love microscopy. Uh, I how we can um, discover new functionality, we need to be open, we need to uh, look at how materials behave. And for example, I can say, a um, collaborator of mine made that material and he kept saying, that's not possible, that's not true, that's not true. And what we have done was just a, a very thorough analysis that included electron microscopy to look at structure, to look at chemical composition, together with other techniques to prove that uh, indeed what we were observed was, was true. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to thank the speakers again. Thank you very much. To thank you for your attention and sorry, I also want to thank you the governance of Area Science Park. Uh, they are sitting in front here, Presidente Caterina Petrillo, General Director Anna Sirica and uh, Director of the Structure Salvatore La Rosa and uh, the Communication Office and especially Francesca Iannelli who coordinated all this event. Thank you very much. Bye.